morning, Grace Church. We are so glad you're here today, staying with us. We are in the house of the Lord. Here we go. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. We sing. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Because he hung up on that cross. And he rose up from that grave, my God still rolling souls away. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. the beggars now we're royalty we were the prisoners now we're running free we are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace let the house of the lord sing praise sing it out we were the beggars now we're royalty we were the prisoners now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We'll shout out. like lightning I saw darkness run for cover but the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have a resurrection power still the miracle I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony this is my testimony from death to life cause 
grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. in water sing the praises of the spirit son and father our god will finish what he started our god will finish what he started this is my testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. You may have a seat. We're going to celebrate new life today. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are yet to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are yet to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are yet to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. This is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony, oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony, from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony.
somebody said amen. This is your testimony. You're God of praise. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. We give you all the praise and all the glory.
Father in heaven, there are, there are no words sufficient enough. There are not enough words to express adequate worship and praise. And Father, with feeble lips and feeble hearts, as we make an attempt to acknowledge who you are and what you've done, to offer you songs and hymns and spiritual songs, but more than that, Father, heads and our hearts and our hands in full devotion to the one who has saved us, we give you praise. Bless our time together, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So again, Grace, uh, welcome. Glad that you're here uh, today. Uh, We are launching uh, a new series today called Future Family, and for the next four weeks, we are going to be talking about our family and your family. And uh, in a, as an addendum to that, we are offering, starting this Wednesday, a five-week uh, small group uh, encounter called Intentional Parenting. So uh, if you um, have not registered for that, you can go to our website and do that before Wednesday, or you can just go to the Orange Balloons in the Commons area, and we'll sign you up for that. Child care is provided. There is a cost for the materials for the course, so you will need to register for that uh, if you intend to come. It starts this Wednesday for the next five weeks. Also, if you are new or newish to Grace, we offer an, an encounter called Step In. Uh, this answers some many of your questions. It allows you to ask some questions of your own. And so uh, if you want to meet some of the staff or some of the elders and get to know who we are and what we do and why we do it the way we, that we, we do it, uh, Step In would be for you. Again, you can register for that online or go to the Orange Balloons in the Commons area and we will uh, sign you up. And as always, in front of you is what we call a seat back cards, and those are your tools to communicate to us so that we can respond to you. So please make use of those if you have a prayer concern or want to take a next step. If you're new, fill those cards out, take those to the orange balloons, and we would love to respond to you in any way that we can. So as I mentioned, we are beginning this series today, Future Family. John Becker is coming to share with us today. So would you welcome John to the stage this morning? I wish I could get my students to applaud when I walk into the classroom. Thank you. Well, right before the end of 2023, my friend Dave contacted me about this Bible plan that he'd seen on the version of the Bible app. It was a plan to read through the entire Bible in chronological order in one year. It's called the Bible Recap, and I think some of you probably are familiar with it. I know a few of you are actually going through it as well. So Dave asked me and my wife, Kate, if we wanted to go through the Bible recap study plan with him and his wife, Rachel. And the four of us have been friends for like over 30 years, and it just seemed like a great way not only to study the Bible, but also to hold one another accountable and have spiritual fellowship at the same time. So we agreed to do that. So on January 1st, we started the book of Genesis, and we're rolling right along, and I don't know, four or five days into Genesis, all of a sudden it shifts gears and jumps to the book of Job. And I didn't realize that the book of Job actually takes place chronologically in the middle of the book of Genesis. So I shifted gears. I read the book of Job, which is a happy, lighthearted book, as we all know. And then I shifted back to Genesis. It was a bit jarring. But after Genesis, you, of course, dive into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And what struck me about these books is how repetitive they are. And I don't say that in a negative way, but there's a lot of stuff that you read and you're like, didn't I just read this? Of course, Exodus talks about how Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and Leviticus lays down the laws for the Israelites. The book of Numbers, Numbers, love Numbers, that it details the censuses, the multiple censuses that they took of the different tribes of the Israelites. And the book of uh, Deuteronomy continues the story of the Israelites. Throughout these books, there are instructions that God gives to Moses that he's to tell to the Israelites. And like I said, there's a great deal of repetition. Did you know, for example, that the Ten Commandments actually occur three times in the Old Testament? I thought that was interesting. And it didn't fully hit me as to why there was so much repetition until I got to Deuteronomy 6, which is our passage for this morning. So I'd like to ask you all to please stand with me as I read Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9. And please remember that these are the words that Moses is speaking to the Israelites that God gave Moses to relate to them. 
It says, now is, this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. So as Tim mentioned, we're beginning today a four-week series on families. And I know that some people may think that this series doesn't apply to them because they don't have kids or their kids are grown and out of the house. But nearly all of us have kids in our lives, whether they're your own or they're your nieces and nephews, your grandchildren, or maybe they're just kids in the neighborhood that you care about. And they need to know Jesus. So I hope that you'll find value over the next four weeks in the message that I share today and the messages that Tyler, Tim, and James share over the next three weeks. So do you remember when you were a kid and your parents told you to clean your room? And the next week, your parents told you to clean your room? And the next week, your parents told you to clean your room? And so on and so on and so on. Some of you parents in the room are probably thinking that you're dealing with that right now. I see a couple of people nodding. Did your parents ever tell you to do something one time and then never had to remind you about it again? No, that's pretty doubtful. And here's what happens. The things that are important to our parents weren't necessarily as important to us as kids. So as time goes by, if they fail to keep the task in front of us, we would forget about it, or we might decide not to do it, or we might choose to just do something else. And this is the pattern that we see where Moses repeatedly instructs the Israelites about God's instructions they happen with regularity in the Old Testament. So I'm going to do a short history lesson. I know I'm a math teacher, and the numbers are coming later. Uh, but right now we're going to do a short history lesson on the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Pentateuch, by the way. And this, uh, this demonstrates the repetitive pattern that Moses engaged in quite well. So Moses does his best to keep the instructions, which are the commandments of the Lord, in front of the Israelites. But what happens is, like children, it takes very little time for them to forget or ignore these commandments and start doing their own thing. In Exodus 32, this is where Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, where he meets with God for 40 days and 40 nights, just 40 days and 40 nights, to receive the Ten Commandments. And let's look at what happens in Exodus 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. Now, there are two phrases here that I really, really love in this verse. The first one is, this fellow Moses. Well, they speak about him as if they don't know him personally. And the reality is that many of them probably don't know Moses personally. We don't think about this when we read it, but the Bible tells us that there were about 600,000 men on foot that left Egypt. That doesn't include the women and the children. Scholars indicate that there were probably an estimate of 2 to 3 million Israelites who left Egypt. Okay, so while everyone knew who Moses was because he was their leader, that didn't necessarily mean that they knew him, and it certainly didn't mean that they all liked him. And the second phrase that Moses, um, that is reflective of Moses that I think is really hilarious is that he was so long in coming down. It was 40 days 
and nights. That's not even six weeks. And in that short time, less than a month and a half, the Israelites assumed that something bad had happened to Moses. They abandoned God and they demanded that Aaron, the high priest, who was also, by the way, Moses' brother, make them a little G God, an idol to stand before them in place of God Almighty. So what does Aaron do? He's the high priest. In fact, when God commanded Moses to go speak to Pharaoh in Egypt, Moses was a little nervous. He took his brother Aaron, and Aaron is the one who spoke on behalf of Moses to the Pharaoh. He's the high priest. So naturally, Aaron condemned this sinful request. He pointed the Israelites back to God because that's what he should have done, right? Unfortunately, that's not what Aaron did. Aaron gave in to their demands. He goes around to these two to three million people, collects all of their gold jewelry, he melts it down, and he casts it into a golden calf for them to worship. And of course, God, being all-knowing and all-present, he knows what's going on down there in the valley, and he's angry. He knows what the Israelites are doing in Moses' absence, and he is ready to bring destruction upon the people. But Moses implores God not to punish him, and God relents. So Moses comes down from the mountain. He's carrying the two stone tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments, and he sees the people dancing before this golden idol, this idol that was crafted by his brother, the high priest. And Moses loses his temper. He throws the tablets to the ground and they break at the base of the mountain. And God actually did end up punishing the Israelites with a plague as well as the death of 3,000 men. And after that, the Israelites repented and they got in line for a while. But then we read in Numbers 11 that the Israelites start to complain about their hardships again. Oh, we're living in the desert. It's so hot out here. It's so hard. God gets angry. And he sets fire to the outskirts of the Israelite camp. So they cry out to Moses again. Moses intercedes and prays on behalf of the people. And the fire dies down. Then they complain about the manna. The manna that God is providing for them every day in the desert. Food for them to eat in a dry, barren desert every day. They begin complaining about it. And not only complaining about it. But they begin reminiscing about how good the food was in Egypt. I guess they forgot about the part where they were slaves in Egypt. God becomes angry at their ungrateful attitude. Moses intercedes on behalf of the Israelites. And this cycle continues over and over again while the Israelites wander the desert. In fact, the whole reason that they wandered in the desert for 40 years is because the Israelites kept disobeying God. Because the trip from Egypt to the promised land, if they had taken a straight route, should take about 11 days. Now think about that. 11 days from Egypt to the promised land, and they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And it was because of this repeated disobedience and complaining, too numerous to retell every incident right now, that's what kept them wandering for 40 years until an entire disobedient generation died. What I've been struck by throughout the Bible study is the scope of time that these early books of the uh, Bible cover and the number of leaders that the Israelite people had over these many generations. After Moses died, and of course Moses did not get to enter the promised land because of an incident of disobedience on his behalf, Joshua became the leader of Israel, and Joshua was a good leader. He was a godly leader. The Israelites followed God throughout Joshua's life. And then when Joshua died... The next generation after Joshua continued to follow God. So that indicates that Joshua did a really good job of helping that generation that came after him to know who God was. But in Judges 2, beginning in verse 10, we read the following. Judges 2, 10 to 12, it says, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. That's the generation after Joshua that had followed God. That generation was gathered to their fathers. That means they died. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. 
And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Baals were false gods. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. And who were these people surrounding the Israelites at the time? Well, they were, there were Philistines. We remember the Philistines were, uh, we see the Philistines with David and Goliath a few hundred years down the road, okay? Also, there were the Canaanites, the Ammonites, the Jebusites, many others. And what would often happen is that the Israelites, against God's express orders, would become attracted to and intermarry with people from these other peoples. And when they intermarried with these other people, they embraced those false gods and the traditions that surrounded those false gods, forgetting about the God of Israel the one true God. So you can probably imagine what happens over the next several generations. God punishes the people for disobeying him and worshiping other gods. The people repent. God raises up a series of judges to lead them. And by the way, these judges were not like courtroom judges. They were more like military leaders, people who were charged with leading the Israelite army. And we pick up this story in verse 16 of Judges 2. It says, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them, the Israelites, out of the hand of those who plundered them. So these judges came and rescued uh, rescued the people out of the hands of the people who were robbing them, stealing from them, keeping them oppressed. Yet they, the Israelites, did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So this pattern continues generation after generation. It seems like no one is looking back at their own history to see why things keep shifting from good to bad to good to bad. That's the end of the history lesson. And by now, I'm sure some of you are asking how this helps us to launch a series on the family. And that question brings us back to our passage today. In Deuteronomy 6, again, verses 4 through 7, it says, Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Now, why am I reading this passage to you again? For the same reason that Moses repeated God's instructions to the Israelites. We need repetition. Remember that this is God telling Moses what he is to relate to the Israelite people. In verse 7, it says to teach his commands diligently to your children. That means to make sure you're doing a good job of it. And he tells them to teach the children when you're sitting at home, when you're out walking around, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. To me, that pretty much sounds like all the time. We're supposed to be teaching our children about God all the time. So as I said, the history lesson is over, but most of you know that I'm a math professor. Yesterday, I was a cup of joy, big surprise. Everybody knows I go to cup of joy all the time. Someone found out I was preaching today, and the first words out of their mouth were, well, what's the math lesson going to be? So I guess I'm earning a reputation, and I don't want to let anybody down. So here come the numbers, all right? I want to share with you some facts and data from an article that's called, What is Going On with Families in America? So in 1937, the Gallup organization, now the Gallup organization is the organization that does polls and surveys on all sorts of things. As we go into an election year, we'll hear lots about Gallup polls and things like that, okay? All the way back in 1937, 
Gallup conducted a survey of how many people in America belonged to some type of religious institution, whether it was a church or a mosque or a synagogue. Of the people surveyed, 73% of the people indicated some type of religious affiliation. 73%, very much a religious nation. And up until 1999, those numbers remained fairly stable. They leveled out at about 70% in 2000. So from 1937 to 2000, about 70% of the people in America reported some sort of a, a religious affiliation. In 2021, just three years ago, Gallup did another survey asking the same question, and the number of Americans who belong to a religious institution had dropped from 70% to 47%. That is a drop of 23% in 21 years. So what do these numbers mean? Well, it indicates there is a mass exodus away from all religious institutions, especially churches, and no single religious affiliation is exempt from this phenomenon. Interestingly enough, this includes people who belong to cults, people who belong to false religions, or even people who adhere to Eastern philosophies. People are departing religion. But at the same time that people are leaving the church in high numbers, Nine in ten people in America say that they still believe in God. That's 90%. 90% of Americans say that they still believe in God. So then the question for me, and should be for all of us, is, okay, what God do they believe in? Because as followers of Jesus Christ, when we ask someone if they believe in God, we just are naturally thinking about Jehovah God, the creator of all things, the one who sent Jesus Christ to die on our behalf. But the person you're asking might not believe in the same God. So when you ask, do you believe in God, and they say yes, that doesn't mean we can necessarily walk away and go, oh, well, they believe in God, thank goodness. We might need to probe a little more deeply because what God do they believe in? You would probably be skeptical to be right about the form of God that people believe in, especially given what's going on in our society today. We certainly do not live in a godly nation. Belief in God, though, is all over the place. I think of that as the little g God that people are believing in. And it's not controversial to believe in God. In fact, as I said, it's well accepted. But what is controversial for many people is to believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. The God who became man and walked among humanity for 33 years. That is controversial to many people. So depending on your data source, somewhere between 60 and 80% of young people who were raised in a church-going family are leaving the church as soon as they can. And many of them refer to themselves as ex-evangelicals. Maybe you've heard this term. There's a, it, it's becoming very, very popular. The Wikipedia definition of ex-evangelicalism is the following. It is a social movement of people who have left evangelicalism especially white evangelical churches in the United States, for atheism, agnosticism, progressive Christianity, or any other religious belief or lack thereof. Now, just in case there's somebody here who's not familiar with the term evangelical or doesn't fully understand what it is, Grace Church is an evangelical church. That means we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he was born of a virgin. He came to earth to die for our sins and rose again after that death, ascending to heaven. He is part of the Holy Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be evangelical. Ex-evangelicals may have believed in Christ at one time and have left the faith, or they may truly have never believed it and left the church as soon as they possibly could. I'm willing to bet that everyone in this room probably knows at least one person who has either walked away from their faith or they would say that they never truly believed in Christ in the first place. And it's really hard when these people are family members, if they're your children or your brothers or sisters, if they're your parents, or if they're close friends. Our hearts ache over the fact that they are lost, and that number of people walking away from the faith continues to increase. This is not a new phenomenon, however. While the word exvangelical may be a new term in our language, Jesus actually told a parable in Luke 15 that frames exvangelicalism quite well. We know it as the parable of the prodigal son. 
So what is it that is causing the numbers of young people that are walking away from the church to increase? Well, I could spend the next several hours sharing various articles and things that I read and research I did, but uh, I don't want to bore you that much. So I'm going to boil it down to just a couple of things that we, we can point to. The article that I cited earlier has the following quote. It says, Genuine faith in Christ is passed through family homes from parent to children more so than through churches and institutions. In other words, children leave the church because it has no meaning to them. So the spiritual instruction of our children is not something that we can pass off to the Sunday school teacher or the youth leader, the wonderful volunteers back in Grace Kids, our wonderful Grace Student Ministries leader. We can't pass that off, not even to the pastor. As parents, we must take the active lead in our homes to teach us, to teach our children to love Jesus. It's our job. Now, I'm going to share a graphic from a study by the American Enterprise Institution. This is an organization that is secular but conservative. It's a research group, uh, and the results from the, uh, this article are entitled The Decline of Religion in American Family Life. We're going to see it up on the screen. And to top off the professorial uh, lesson, I brought my laser pointer. I actually ordered this over the weekend. I figured I'm going to lean, I'm going to lean heavily into the fact that people razz me about being a teacher. So... Anyway, you have this in your program, all right? And this is, um, by percentage, people who participated in the following activities at least once a week growing up by age group. And what I want you to notice, in the first category, we have people who attended religious services with their family. Now, the, the dark blue bar over here on the left, these are people over the age of 65. So this is an older generation. And you can see that over half of the uh, people over the age of 65, attended some sort of religious gathering on a weekly basis. The next group down are the people between 50 and 64, and you can see that that next generation is less likely to have attended church. Then we get down to people who are 32 to 49, and we see it's dropped down to 33%. can't read. I think it says 33. Does it say 33? It does. I'm getting old. And then uh, the last category, these are people ages 18 to 29. Only 29% of them would indicate that they attended church services growing up. The next category is people who said grace or prayed with family at meals. And the final category is people who attended Sunday school or other religious programs, whether it's a catechism or something like that. And you can see that the older generations were more likely to have done that. That indicates what we're seeing in our society today is similar to what Moses was dealing with in the Old Testament and Joshua and the judges. The generations are forgetting as we go on. It's evident that these results, from these results, that the younger generations are not receiving the same information, the same religious instruction that our older generations did. And part of the reason for this is that families are spending less time together than ever before. Some studies show that for a variety of reasons, families are spending an average of only 45 minutes per day together. And whether it's because of busy schedules, shifting priorities, or our electronic devices, we don't make time for our kids like previous generations did. And I know that I've been guilty of this myself. Um, a few years ago, one of my adult daughters told me that because I worked two jobs to make ends meet as a school teacher, I wasn't home enough when she was growing up. And that was a hard thing to hear. That was a really hard thing to hear. So I'm not standing up here telling you that I did it right. But I am issuing a warning about what's going on in our society because maybe somebody will hear this and they'll get it right and they'll make a positive change in their own family life. So over the next few weeks, we're going to learn more about the family and how we can restore, grow, and maintain better family relationships, both with God and with our family members. So I want to pose a question for you to ask yourself that comes from the article I've been referencing. I want you to take this question home with you and contemplate what your answer might be. These are the only blanks to fill in on your, on your sheet if you brought that, uh, if you grabbed one of those when you walked in. The question is this. 
what decision do I need to make that will best help my children to find Christ? What decision do I need to make that will best help my children to find Christ? If you're a married couple, should mom or dad quit their job and come home? Sounds like something that would be impossible to afford, but is that a question you need to consider? Should we go to church more often? I'll probably get in trouble for this one, but a question that you can ask is, should we leave the church we're going to and go to another church? Don't want anybody to leave, but the reality is we need to be in a church where we are being spiritually fed and where our children are being spiritually fed, and then we can go home and have those conversations with our kids and help them grow in the faith. Should we homeschool or send them to a private school? This last one hits particularly close for me. My, my oldest daughter, we homeschooled our, all eight of our kids. Our youngest daughter hated being homeschooled. I hope she doesn't watch the live stream because I didn't ask permission to talk about this, but she hated being homeschooled. And she told us, I'm never going to do this to my kids. This is... She got dramatic. I don't know if she ever referred to it as child abuse, but she sure made me feel like we were, we were being horrible to her. And she said, I would never do this to my kids. And she graduated from high school, graduated from college with honors, became a professional, and then she became a mom. And she's given us two beautiful grandkids who are five and two and a half. And she came to us a while back. I don't remember exactly when. And she said, you know, I hated being homeschooled. And Kate and I said, yes, we're aware. You've made that abundantly clear over the years so that you hated being homeschooled. But then she said, but I get it. I understand now that she's a parent. She understands. And uh, her oldest daughter, well, her only daughter, she's got a boy and a girl. But our granddaughter is five, and she's going to be starting school in the fall. And she's looking into homeschooling options and homeschooling co-ops and stuff because she doesn't want the education system that is turned so far away from God to influence her children. So she's looking into those options, trying to figure out homeschool co-op, a private school, what is she going to do? By the way, parents, if you have kids who are ungrateful, be patient. Hang in there. Wait till they have kids. There is nothing more rewarding than when your adult children come back to you and go, you know what? I get it. I get it. So hang in there. But these are hard questions to ask, and maybe there are other questions that you need to think about. But you need to count the cost of not properly t teaching your children about Jesus Christ, and when you do, you will realize that these are questions that you have to ask and answer for yourself. We're going to prepare for a time of communion right now, and as we do that, I want to encourage you to come back over the next three weeks to hear Tyler, Tim, and James as they share more on this topic of family. And parents... I hope you'll consider signing up for the intentional parenting class that Tim talked about. It starts this Wednesday night. You can go to the events page at connectedgrace.org for those details. So at this time, I'd like for each of us to take a few moments to reflect on the condition of our heart. Some of us, myself included, might be feeling a bit discouraged over the spiritual state of our children or of our family. And if you're feeling that way, I would like for you to just take a moment right now to silently reach out to God and ask him for comfort and wisdom. Let's just offer up a prayer to God right now for family members who are far from him. If there's something in your heart that you need to confess, you can offer that up to God right now as well and ask for his forgiveness. He loves you so much, and he wants to extend that forgiveness. In Psalm 139, King David wrote, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. If there's something you're struggling with right now, take a moment, offer that up to God, and ask for forgiveness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
the Apostle Paul writes the following. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you this morning. We love you so much, God, and we know that you love us infinitely more than we can ever imagine. I pray for any families here who are struggling with their children. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray that you would guide them, give them clear direction. Help our children who have wandered from you to come back. Soften their hearts, Lord, just as you did the prodigal son. God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, John. Would you stand with us? Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Trust him with our lives, with our families, all that he's given us. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. And what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. My Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I know the is my story and this is my song praising my risen King and Savior all the day long I trust in God my Savior Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and 
he will direct your path. Families, put our trust in the Lord. I sought the Lord, sing that with me. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard. trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God. Father, we give our lives to you. We give all that we have to you. We entrust all that you've given to us back to you, knowing that you have a plan for us that is good and full of hope. We anticipate what you will do in our lives, and we follow you. Guide and direct us as we, as we take our various paths, as we live our weeks, as we live with our families, as we do our jobs. Father, that all that we do and say every day of the week, may we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. We'll see you next week.